Are we ready? I think we're ready. Okay. Do you want to go first, Nate, or do you want me to go? Oh, you can go. I'm just here to control the Zoom piece. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, we're still remote, obviously, and the state has allowed us to still um, meet remotely, which is a good thing. So um, because this is a public hearing, I think the first thing we should do is introduce ourselves and um, we'll take it from there. So I'm Gail Lansky and I am going to help chair this meeting along with Nate. Uh, All right. I'm Lucas Hanscom. Next. Committee. Becky Michaels. Um, Paul Goulston. Andrew Grant Rick, Thomas. Rika Clement. And Matt Andrew Larson. Oh, hold on, we got two at the same time. Oh, did I cut Andrew off again? Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> Me? Yes. Andrew Grant Thomas. Okay, and I think, and Nat? Nat, Nat Larson. So we have Nat and Nate. Um, and so I just would at this point would like to acknowledge Andrew for all his contributions to this committee during our many deliberations and thank him for his service. Uh, this is his last meeting. He's got other things going on in his life, which unfortunately for us is going to draw him away from his work on this committee, but they'll, uh, he'll always have a seat at the table. So Andrew, thank you. And I've learned a lot from you and um, you will be missed, but no, you're always welcome back. Thank you, Gail. This is a part where, you know, following our national politicians, I say, I'm withdrawing to spend more time with my family. You know, we will see no more of this scandal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's been a lot. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a ton. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, you're Andrew. Welcome. I'm going to Scott Mersbach write something up, kind of, you know, just, just to for the intrigue of it all, um, <laughs> something scandalous. If you could replicate yourself, we'll take another one of you who doesn't have family <laughs> obligations. You know, something about texting and, you know, it's all kind it's seedy, it's seedy, whatever it is. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to um, hand it over to Nate at this point to um, review ongoing activities from the CARES grant. Sure, yeah, thanks everyone. So we have um, you know, nine people in attendance uh, and then the committee. The, um, I think we, you know, we're, um, as Gail said, we're still allowed to meet through Zoom because the state still suspended the uh, open meeting law for now and they may extend it through September 1st. So our meetings in the summer may still be through Zoom or they may go back to being in person, but for now it's Zoom. The, um, this is a public hearing, it's required by the state to have an update on current activities. And currently the only grant that's ongoing is our uh, block grant, our CARES money that we awarded last uh, summer fall. So our 2019 grant and 18 grant, all those activities are closed out, which is really nice. Sometimes we have three grants going on at the same time, which means we have, you know, like a dozen activities. So um, we only have four, um, four, four activities right now. That's the first part of the hearing. The second part of the hearing is to receive comments on the 2021 application process. So, you know, just quickly for everyone in the audience and the committee, you know, the state wasn't going to have a round. Well, first they thought they were gonna have a 21 grant process, you know, which we went through in the fall and winter um, and have an application due in March. And then they postponed it a number of months. And then they at first thought they were not gonna have a 21 round. They, you know, they proposed canceling it and merging it with next year's grant application process. And I think they were met with a lot of pushback. And so then they came uh, with another revision just a few weeks ago and said, well, we'll do a 21 round. It's somewhat abbreviated and they'll have it, you know, this summer from June, starting in June and applications are due in early September. So, uh, so you know, we can hear, um, you know, comments for uh, priorities for the 21 process. You know, we had public meetings and hearings in the fall and winter. So we still could use some of those comments that were heard then, uh, but all the proposals that were submitted have to be, you know, they have to be resubmitted. So, you know, even if, you know, even if an organization is using this, you know, isn't changing much except for budget or timeline or something, um, they have to resubmit it, you know, during 
this time. So the state has said that their application round uh, is open when they put out their one year plan, which was I think a week and a half ago. So within this time frame, from like you know mid May to mid September, that's when we have to hold our whole application process. So we can't do it beforehand. Um, so that's the two parts to the hearing tonight. And then afterward, you know, there's a public meeting just to discuss the comments and set out a schedule. Uh, I, I sent some draft dates. It doesn't give us a lot of time. Usually we have, uh, you know, six to eight months to do this. And so, you know, now we're only have three months. So um, I think the work in the fall can be fruitful since we've, you know, updated the RFP and did receive comments. So I think we're still in a good position for this application round. And um, we could just go down the list if everyone's here. If not, then we can um, skip around a little bit. But um, I'm not sure I see anyone from Valley CDC. So we could uh, go to the food pantry. And Lev, we'll, uh, you can unmute yourself and let us know if there's anyone else here. Great. Uh, should I be on camera as well? Or just, I don't see if they have a video. Yeah, I don't think as a, we set this up as a webinar. So even if you're speaking, I think we can't see unless. Uh, That's fine. I just wasn't sure if I had done something wrong. No problem. I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think, ben, we, sorry, hold on a minute. Ben, we can't, she doesn't, even if she's speaking her video, unless we promote her to panelists, right? Yeah, yeah, that would okay. be the only way. Okay. Sorry, Lev, I think you're all set to go. I just want to make sure we weren't missing something either, but. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you so much um, to the committee for the support through the CDBG CARES funds. Um, we set out with some very ambitious goals around um, providing monthly groceries to 3,000 low and moderate income Amherst residents. That was a 50% increase than we had served in the past. Um, improving access to food pantry groceries for those both with COVID related health and transportation barriers. Um, and then other, I expanded to just other transportation barriers by offering both grocery delivery um, to 700 to 1000 Amherst residents, as well as on site pickup and um, a scheduled curbside option. And then we also set out to increase our food allocation to between 10 to 14 days of food monthly. This was double what it had been um, in the past, um, as well as offering emergency box mid-month supplements for families who needed more food, expanding our evening and weekend hours, um, and just the other costs of operation in COVID. And so um, at this point, we are around 60% of our way to the, our goal of serving 3,000 Amherst residents. Um, we have had a significant increase from the past, but not to the level that we were originally anticipating at the beginning of COVID. Um, at the time that we were initially applying for these funds, we were seeing 400% uh, increases in new enrollments in the food pantry week over week, um, and that has really leveled out. Um, the thing that we have seen really significant increases that have sustained is the consistency with which families are coming to the food pantry. So rather than uh, coming every couple of months, et cetera, people are really, or just a few times a year, people are really consistently um, coming every month and indicating that they need more food. So that's really a place that we have focused. Um, we have reached the goal of uh, increasing our food to um, at least 10 days per household um, and are working, still working to further increase that to get to that 10 to 14 days. Um, so that's been a really significant increase and that's come directly in response to feedback we've received from families who are accessing the groceries. Um, additionally, the both the delivery program and the curbside pickup program have been just enormous successes. And I, again, am really appreciative to this committee for their support and helping us uh, get those to the scale that they are. Um, the curbside pickup is something that we were uh, just testing out as this grant first started. And what that allows is for people to 
pre-schedule ahead a time to pick up their groceries. There's a simple online form that folks can use and someone without computer access can call us and we do it for them. They select a 10 minute window out of the times available every day that we are open. Um, they have a space on that form to indicate any preferences that they have for the types of groceries that they're getting, what kinds of that are different than their regular monthly preferences that we have on file um, and any other special notes. And then we fully assemble that grocery. They pull it into our parking lot and we load it into their trunk at the designated time. And just a couple of days ago, actually, I um, we got a comment from someone afterwards that indicated, wrote, it was so awesome. Thank you so much. I had missed a couple of months of picking up food because I had to take a half day off of work to make sure it would happen. And I learned about this curbside option from the bookmark that came with my books from the library. It took less than 10 minutes start to finish and I will definitely do it again next month. Um, and similarly, we've just gotten really amazing feedback, uh, for, especially with families with kids in the car, just being able to schedule something, pull in and get their groceries that way has been a huge access uh, improvement for people. So really glad to have that available. Um, and utilization of the curbside has really increased. And then the delivery is the other um, huge access uh, project that we were working on. Um, we have uh, delivered groceries to, sorry, looking at my notes, um, to around 850 Amherst residents um, at 21 different coordinated sites and individual household routes in Amherst. So we are reaching a large percentage of our um, Amherst residents for the food pantry through delivery options. Um, and again, the feedback around it, I think we, this was a part of the program that was really born out of necessity early on in COVID. Uh, folks that just no longer had transportation or based on health risks couldn't come in. And what we're really seeing is just the amount of access that it increases in terms of helping people to get uh, the food that they need uh, without having to take multiple buses to the center or borrow a car or pay for an Uber to get them to the food pantry. So we've been really pleased to sustain that. Um, and then we have added back in our evening and weekend hours. Um, we have maintained the emergency box as indicated. So the project is going um, really well with those increases. And I think now as we look ahead to the future, it's really a question for us around integrating kind of the, the best of what the center's food pantry has always offered, which certainly we're looking forward to being able to return to a full choice grocery shop on site but really continuing these efforts such as curbside pickups and delivery that have so significantly increased access uh, for area residents. So that is the update that I specifically wanted to share um, unless there are any questions from the committee. I raised my hand. Can, do I need to get called on, Nate? You're the chair, Gail. Oh. <laughs> um, so Lev, just to, um, do you have any idea when you, like? I like to follow protocol, Nate. Do you have any idea when um, you might be able to open up the food pantry in person? That's part A of the question. And B, when that happens, will you still continue curbside and delivery? So I will answer part B first. Um, which is that that is our hope. Um, I, we will not likely be able to continue them quite at the scale that they are, but we also trust that uh, once we have the full choice pantry again open on site, that there will, that for folks who do have some transportation access, that that will be a preference. And so there'll be a natural transition there of people off of delivery towards that. Um, we do not have a date yet. Uh, for for that transition, but are certainly, um, you know, definitely looking to do that in this upcoming, our fiscal year starts on July. So I think about things in fiscal year. So in this upcoming fiscal year, but um, we do not have a specific uh, date set yet. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? I don't really have a question, but just 
I want to say congratulations to Lev and the team. It's just amazing what the Survival Center has done throughout all of this and um, will continue to do. So it's just amazing to hear about all the work you've done. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, it has been the most colossal team effort, um, truly. It's just been absolutely unbelievable the ways that so many different members of our community have stepped forward from residents connecting with their neighbors and helping with outreach and letting people know to people offering to drive food to their neighbors' doorsteps and you know volunteering to do delivery routes to all the folks that have been at the center throughout this entire year. So um, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I echo those sentiments of just thanking the, the broader community for everyone, everything that they have contributed. Any other questions? Nate, do you have any other final business with Lev? No, no, we had a site visit. Um, it went well. And I think the, um, I was going to say too, that the state, you know, um, they think that we're doing a good job with this CARES grant. So they, you know, they, um, you know, they are keeping track of it as well. And so they, you know, they haven't, um, usually at this point, if there was an issue with spending down money, you know, or, or something, right, if they thought there was a concern about how things are progressing, they might, might say something, but they, um, they are really positive with our activity. So I think that's a good sign too. Yeah, so thanks, Lev. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, okay, great. And then the next, uh, Lev, let's see, this will just take a minute. Um, oh, she's already moved over. Um, Laura, there's a uh, housing support and stabilization, that's family outreach. And I know Laura's here. Laura, let, let us know if there's um, anyone else here to speak as well. Yeah, the, um... The caseworker who is funded through this uh, grant is here. Her name is Maria Cabanas. Yep. Okay. Maria, you should, um, I think you should be all set to speak as well. Great. And so, right. you know, I will sort of report on what we've been doing. And then if folks have questions, you may want to ask. I asked Maria to come because mm -hmm. if it's specific to services, um, it's nice to hear from her. Uh, so, and I guess I also just want to open it up by saying a big thank you to Lev because so many of our families, so many of our clients, you know, have stayed alive through this last year because of the Survival Center. And, um, you know, we work with a very large population of um, undocumented immigrants who, um, was they were not able to get unemployment. They were not able to get any um, any type of support, uh, government support. So their food, they, the way they fed their children was through much through um, the survival center. So I just have to give a shout out to that, um, to them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and that's what, you know, family outreach, uh, we have a lot of different services. We provide a lot of different um, support to families in Amherst, as well as individuals. Uh, everything from the CDBG COVID uh, funded uh, support and stabilization that specifically funded a caseworker to work with folks who had been um, affected by COVID and making sure their housing was um, was stable. And as you all, I think, probably know, uh, that means a whole plethora of stuff. It means helping folks apply for unemployment benefits so they can pay their rent, so they can stay housed, to um, helping them with resources for their kids so they can actually go to work, so they can pay their rent and they can stay housed. Um, folks that have a subsidy uh, their rent was adjusted, but for a lot of folks uh, that we work with, they did not get it. They don't have a subsidy or for whatever reason, their um, rent was not adjusted to a point of not having to pay any rent. And they, so they did. Uh, of course, once the, as you probably all know, there's a, um, an eviction moratorium right now. And what one of the things that we've been trying to do is help families and a big job of what Maria has been do doing is helping families apply for the emergency funds through the town of Amherst or through different, different funds so they don't get too far behind. 
you know, if you, if you have lost your job, if your children are home, so you cannot go back to work, if you can get work, um, but you can't go back and you pay full market rent, you could be tens of thousands of dollars in debt by the end of this. And so what we're trying to do is keep that from happening by helping folks apply throughout the time. And then also apply for the folks who are eligible, applying for um, unemployment, for the folks who are not, um, but can find jobs, helping to find jobs. Um, those are some of the main things that Maria has been doing. She's also been doing things like just helping folks find winter coats, winter clothes, because of course their income, they don't have any income. Uh, Love has been really focusing on, although they did distribute warm clothes, but they've been focusing on food, of course, because that'll keep you alive. But we've, we've distributed um, lots and lots of warm, warm uh, cold weather clothing to folks. Um, and then, there were some folks, one of the things that happened at, when the pandemic hit is that families who kind of looked, families and individuals, I should say individuals, because we did work with more than we've ever worked this past year. And families who um, were living maybe doubled up, living in not a, a perfect housing situation, but it was working out. When the pandemic hit and folks were worried about the number of people in their home or all the kids home all the time, all of a sudden people who are welcome weren't so welcome. And so one of the things the caseworker also did is help folks, uh, families like that who were sleeping on the couch, sleeping on the floor, the kids were in a two bedroom with their sister who had four kids, that kind of thing. All of a sudden, people were out staying there welcome because of, um, you know, everybody was in the house and the kids were always home and managing the Zooms of the school and all that. So one of the things that a caseworker has been doing it, or has done is help families get into um, homeless shelters, which leads them to the journey of finding a home of their own. Um, so sometimes that feels lousy, but actually in this case, it's not the worst thing. You move into a shelter, you move down the path of finding your own home, which is a good thing. Um, we've worked with more individuals than we've worked with in the past. One of part of this um, uh, proposal and what was asked of us was to also work with individuals and we've worked with a lot of those. Maria has been um, uh, had hours at uh, Not Bread Alone, the soup kitchen that I also oversee. So she's been a present there. She's built relationships with chronically homeless folks and help them. Uh, she saved the housing of one very tough situation from a Zoom, um, a Zoom court uh, situation. We've been working very uh, much closer than we ever have with um, uh, Mary Beth Ogolinski from uh, the um, Senior um, Center. So, uh, you know, crisis uh, brings opportunity, right? That's like the kind of the oldest uh, cliche in the book. And yet for us, it's been a little bit true. Uh, we have created partnerships with folks that we had you know, some partnerships with, but now we are, we have much more of that kind of uh, wraparound um, service. And I think that's really good. I don't think, I, hopefully that won't go away. You know, there's lots of things we want to go away, but there's some things that have, you know, some good things that have come of this, right? And I think that may be one of them is that we are more, we found better ways. Um, we are, uh, Maria has been going to Not Bread Alone. Not Bread Alone has never missed a day. And so uh, while they've been serving outside, they are seeing people face to face. And Maria has been working with folks face to face right along. Um, I think our caseworkers at Family Outreach, um, we didn't get, you know, we never got the funding for the CDBG funding. That doesn't mean we didn't do the work. We were doing the work. We just didn't get paid for it. Uh, but um, we had a lot of caseworkers who were actually seeing clients and it takes a lot of courage and I feel very proud of them. Um, and so we are starting to do home visits as much as families feel okay. We're, every one of our staff is fully vaccinated and let's, let's hope it stays that way. Let's hope we're on the road to opening up our world. Yeah. So I, I can answer questions or if you want to direct something to Maria about her families, that's whatever you would like. Of 
questions, anyone? <clears throat> All right, Actually, yeah. I do have one. I do have one okay. question, okay. Laura. You yeah. mentioned that um, moving into a shelter helps them get on the path to their own home. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that? That was that was interesting to me. Yeah, um, the way the shelter system works these days is that often when you go into a sh shelter, you either become a candidate for something called rapid re rehousing, where you go into a system where the the um, uh, there's a subsidy on a unit that lasts for a few years um, and you get put on other lists. You also get prior, you know, you get moved up on certain lists as priority because it, you're in a shelter. Uh, it also, it, sometimes it's a good thing to have more supports right there in your home for whatever reason, whatever's going on. And so if there are underlying issues that have made um, uh, stable housing tough, sometimes an outreach worker can only do so much and having on-site staff is a good thing. And so there's a number of different reasons why, you know, it's not fun. I, I used to do relief at a, at a shelter. Folks do the best they can, but it's not fun living in a, in a shelter, but sometimes it's a, it's the next, it's, it's a step in, in the right direction. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Maria, for taking your evening and coming, even though there was no questions, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, thank you all. I think I finally figured out how to unmute, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's not, it, hopefully my wife doesn't hear, but she started a new job and she had a, a Zoom meeting with uh, like, you know, 20 team members Earlier this week, and her camera wouldn't work, <laughs> so she was uh, she was hidden for twenty minutes until they could figure out how to how to make it work. And I thought that was kind of funny because it's just only over Zoom would you not be able to see your coworkers <laughs> at, at, in an introductory meeting. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Laura and Maria. The um, yeah, so you, the um, you mentioned the other block grant money, but you know, so the town, the 2020 grant, I think since Laura brought it up, you know, we that was delayed too. So we did, you know, apply, and usually we receive that funding in the fall, but we didn't start those contracts until um, March. So you know, everything's been delayed quite a bit uh, this past year with with the grant cycle, um, but it, the money is available now. All right, well, if there's no questions, thank you. I think we'll, it was a good segue, Rika, because then uh, Craig's Doors is here so we can just move on to <laughs> the questions about sheltering. All right, Denise and Kevin, you're, you're able to unmute yourselves and- uh... Okay. Hi. There we How go. How are you folks? Thank you for- <laughs> the opportunity to speak with you. And I'm Kevin Newman from Craig's Doors and Denise Barbarette is our Director of Administration and Finance. And um, anyway, it was, it's been a crazy long year as, as, as it has with everyone with COVID. Um, we did the opposite of what, what the norm was during COVID. We opened our doors wider and expanded our programs rather than shrink them. Um, because despite the fact that COVID was a horrible nightmare and uh, so many people, over 3 million people worldwide have died, uh, there was more government, federal government money available to do things with than there was. I can give it all back for the three and a half million lives, but uh, I, I don't get that choice. So um, we were able to bounce back from leaving the Baptist church and we were able to get the Unitarian Universalists to take us in because they were not using their site. And um, that's been working out real well. We have 14 beds there where it's called our congregate shelter. And then simultaneously, we were able to broker a deal with the University Motor Lodge, uh, Hampshire Hospitality Group. And we were able to use 20 rooms there. And some people were couples or son and daughter, uh, uh, son and um, mother and father and son. So we had about 24 people at one point there. 
And then uh, the same owner of the University Motor Lodge was pleased with what we did and the way it worked. So uh, the opportunity came up in February for us to open the Econo Lodge, which had been closed since April. So we rented 19 rooms on the ground floor of the Econo Lodge, which was a, a blessing because we were able to, all told, like today, for example, we have 58 people. Whereas last year at the Baptist Church, we were only able to do 28 people provide for 28 people and that was only between 9 30 at night and 8 in the morning whereas now it's 24 hours a day and um, thanks to the, the support from this committee we were able to have a, a part-time case manager to supplement the case management team that we have and the housing search workers so um, they've seen at least 50 50 people um, since this started um, our unduplicated count, we estimate somewhere around 158, maybe 160 people. Uh, and the, the problem that we're facing right now, though, is the Econolodge will be returned uh, on the 17th of June. And the governor is ending the state of emergency on the 15th of June. So any of the FEMA reimbursement that we were so uh, glad to receive will all go away on the 15th of June. We won't be able to bill FEMA for anything. And that's, that's unfortunate because that, that's what opened the door to these motels. It's also, just as an aside, uh, it's also was fascinating to me because I've never been in the motel business or hotel business, never really wanted to. Uh, but here we were running a motel then too. Um, the the fascinating part to me having worked with people who were homeless for many many years uh over 30 um was the the difference the agency the dignity that a door and that's what we named craig's doors for provided to the very same people who would be in the congregate shelter so i, I was likening it to the uh, brown eyes blue eyes experiment of the of the 70s 60s actually uh in iowa when martin luther king was assassinated I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, the, the same people who behave a certain way in the congregate shelter behave so much differently. When they had a room, they had agency, as I said, they had uh, a door to, to close, to control. Uh, they had uh, the ability to smoke or even drink in their room. Uh, that wasn't uh, an issue in, in, in a private room, whereas in the congregate shelter, it's not allowed. So um, yeah, it worked out well, and uh, it is still working out well. The problem we have now with this June 15th deadline coming, uh, and we have to close the, uh, the uh, Econolodge is we're gonna have more people than we have spaces. And uh, that's gonna be very difficult to be able to whittle it down. We're now working with people, trying to get them into housing, trying to get them into some kind of program. Um, but that's, uh, that's difficult to do in such a short period of time. But generally speaking, the money that was funded from this committee for the case management enabled people to get, you know, forms. It's amazing, you know, there's all this vote, all this talk about voters and, and, and ID and stuff like that. People keep sort of guffawing, if you will, about, well, how hard is it to get an ID? You know, it's very hard to get an ID, especially if you've lost yours and you don't have your birth certificate, you don't have your social security card. In this, you know, post 9-11 era, it is very hard to get these things, you know, and, and the government agencies that aren't open, you can't go down there and kind of negotiate this with them. So you have to do it all over the phone. It's, it's very difficult, but that's what the case managers are doing. They're helping people get social security cards. They get uh, birth certificates, uh, social security benefits, driver's licenses, state identification cards, all those things that... Uh, that uh, seem like just easy to do, uh, but they're not. And especially in the post-COVID world, it's everything is harder. We also help them get cell phones. Uh, we help them with, with the writing up their resumes and applying for jobs. We help them with making appointments for their PCP or, or uh, their mental health counselors. We help them with tax preparation um, assistance and Getting their stimulus checks is another thing that's not that easy to do when you don't have an address or you haven't filed taxes in re recent years. This all becomes much, much more complicated. But in any case, we, uh, we, we're plodding along and we are hoping that going forward, we will be able to uh, uh, rebuild on this case management component because it's a very important piece. And uh, 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 we also want to thank the Survival Center for providing lunches during this period of time because the 
their their uh, walk-in ability for people who are homeless were uh, was having to take a second seat to to the um, the increased production of food, but they didn't forget to send us some lunches. So because they knew the people that would normally be going there uh, couldn't. So Monday through Friday, well not Wednesday, but uh, Monday through Friday we do have access to the food at, at through the uh, for lunch at the survival center. And then not bread alone on weekends. We want to thank them because that that helps people. We provide a meal in the morning and at night, but during the day, during the middle part of the day, we we ask people to either receive the food from the survival center or go to the not bread alone kitchen. So we want to thank them, and also Kevin Smith, who many of you may know from her work at the survival center. But she's, I don't know if she's still working there, but she set up a, a clothing alternative through Grace Episcopal Church which was fantastic. So that we could actually, we could actually send her an order of things that people in sizes and things that people needed. And, uh, and they would fill it, bring it and whatever the guest didn't want, and they would be able to return it. It was it, it's a phenomenal system they created and one which I hope can continue. Um, we, you know, also going forward, we're trying to put together a coalition to possibly purchase one or the other of the motels so that we can develop them into permanent affordable housing or both if we get lucky. But uh, these are deals that would require, uh, you know, multiple different agencies. We're, you know, presently talking with Valley CDC and uh, uh, Wayfinders to see, because, you know, we're such a small organization, it's not likely we'd be able to borrow the money from a bank to purchase these uh, places. But, but motel conversion is a, uh, um, a growing trend in America these days, especially since some of the, these motels are distressed uh, if, thanks to COVID, no one was traveling so much. So if we can convert one or both of these motels into permanent supportive housing, that would go a long way to uh, helping the people who are homeless in our community. So we're optimistic about that. It's a bit of a Hail Mary throw as they say, <clears throat> but uh, it is still something that uh, we keep our eye on in terms of uh, keeping our eye on the prize. Um, it's, I can't, I, I, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, it's been a marathon, you know, like we started in, in, in uh, November of, of uh, 2019 and then by the spring COVID hit and then we've been running ever since nonstop. So. It's been very difficult, but we, we are really appreciative of the support uh, that folks give us, and particularly this committee as well. I'll stop here and let Denise add whatever she thinks is that I might have missed. And also, if you folks have questions, we'll be happy to answer those as well. Well, I think one of the most important things that our caseworkers have done have has been that they have been there to help people and to encourage them and to give them the support that they need because if people had to do this on their own, they would just give up. Um, I, I deal with a lot of this same type of stuff and it just takes you forever to get through on the internet. You can't talk to people, you try and upload things and you just have to keep trying and sometimes do a lot of swearing. But if people just had to do this on their own, they might not have the technological skills. They might just say, I just can't get through here and this is never gonna work. So I'm just gonna give up. So I really think that the caseworkers have provided this human element and this human support that people really, really need to keep going, especially now. Denise, you still there? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I have a question for either of you. I'm just curious. So some people stay in the church and some people stay in um, the two different motels. Who makes the determination as to who will stay at which facility? And once you're in at a facility, are you allowed to stay there until you get housing? Or do you have to kind of like rotate people through so that it becomes sort of fair that, you know, people can have a chance to stay at the motel and then they have to kind of go back to the church. Well, it started out as a very illogical and methodical process when we had the, um, when we had the, just the one motel, we, we focused on women, uh, elderly and those with special needs. When the opportunity came to, to operate the, um, 
the Econolodge? Well, then we didn't have enough staff to do both. So we ended up closing the UU for 12 days. And we took all the staff from the UU over to Hadley and brought all the guests that were staying at the UU to Hadley. So then our system went right out the window because then anybody and everybody got a room in the hotel. And then within 12 days, we were able to hire enough people to reopen the, uh, the Unitarian Meeting House. And so th then we went back to our criteria, but we didn't eject anybody from the motels that was already there. People who did have to leave were those who couldn't follow basic rules like don't smoke in the room, you know? No, I'm not smoking. Well, how come it smells like you're smoking in the room? And in one case at the, uh, at the, at the University Lodge, that, that's an old place that was grandfathered in. So it, didn't have, it doesn't have sprinklers. So it's a rule we have to hold take very seriously and hold very, very fast to but uh but and some people you know when they're inebriated forget those rules and uh, they think it's no big deal it's just me and i'm just doing one cigarette and then you know but uh so for things like that we did have to put people out or if there was an excessive fighting or something like that which didn't happen that often but sometimes did and now we're going we're using that same criteria to to repopulate the university motor lodge and close down the um uh, the Econolodge, it's just going to be a real dreadful thing. Thankfully, though, it's it's in June, you know, not in May or April or, or March or anything like that. So we're, we're grateful for that. It's so, you know, if we had it all to do over it, if we had all kinds of time, we would have probably been able to handle it better. But we did the best we could with the opportunities that came our way when they came up. And um, you know, we just danced around whatever obstacles were there and got it done. So. We're pleased with the result, but it's, it, it is a little chaotic and it will be a little bit hard for people. And you'll probably hear of some people saying, well, it should have been me that, you know, one of the things they joke with the staff about is that there are 58 people. So every one of them has an agenda and that's their primary interest. And as they should, that's their job. But for us, we're, we're dealing with all 58 of them at the same time, trying to be fair. And uh, people who don't get what they think someone else got always seem to think it's not fair. So. It's, it's, uh, it's opened a new door also in how to manage. Congregate shelters are not the wave of the future, we hope. The problem is that as, the, as everyone relaxes, and I'm one of those people who doesn't understand the haste to, to, to relax these COVID restrictions, but anyway, uh, that's just me, especially with variants in India that no one understands and other places. But um, presumably when the, when the COVID scare is gone, They'll, the federal government will go back to not providing that many resources, that much in terms of resources. So we'll go, we'll have to go back to congregate shelters, which is a, is not a good plan because we've proven that this other model can work, and not just here, not just us. People have proven this all across the country that it's the first step to permanent affordable housing. And in a town like Amherst, and thank you, Nate and and Ben, uh, for your work on that that. Uh, Inclusionary zoning, uh, that's fantastic. We think that's great uh, because the last three or four housing projects, four or five housing projects in Amherst didn't include any affordable housing. And it makes it almost un insurmountable to rent a, a, a room with the fair market rates that are available for the rapid rehousing program around here. Um, so then you have to look out beyond Amherst. And it's, it's very challenging. And that's that's what we're hoping to step up as, as we come in around the corner to June 15th and uh, have to close the Econo Lodge. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? I have a question. Um, yes. Hi, Kevin. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about the, um, the noted, noting the agency and dignity and what that what having a room can give to people. And I was curious whether there was any thought if you are able to put together a collaborative to purchase a hotel in keeping that as a shelter rather than converting it to housing or whether you see the housing as a sort of a, a bigger, I don't, I don't wanna say a bigger issue, but sort of looking more long-term versus helping people well, no, we would want to make it into permanent affordable housing because to us, housing is a human right and we would want to not settle for shelter. Yes, we need a shelter. That's another problem that we have. We're homeless ourselves. As at the end of uh, July, 
because the UU did extend, the, the, we were originally, uh, we had an agreement to, to, to work from their space until April 30th, and they graciously agreed to let us continue until July 31st, but they're hoping to reopen. And there isn't enough space for two of us, you know, for our program and their congregation. So, uh, so at the end of July, we don't have a shelter, basically. And we've already got at least 58 people that showed up this year. There's more than that. It's like probably closer to 108. We've already proven that they're there. Uh, so we have a problem that we're working on. Actually, I'm meeting tomorrow with uh, uh, Paul Bachman has set up a committee to look into this very issue to try and identify a site. But in terms of the motels, we would be looking to convert those into permanent supportive housing. That would be our choice. And it would also be um, the preference of the funding sources. In order to drive this wheel, you have to have uh, subsidies that are project based. You know what I mean? So uh, someone's got to pay the rent and they would pay and the guests would pay 30% of their income. So it could be a little, as low as $5 or it might be 230 or whatever it is. But that makes it affordable for them. And, uh, and also, there's no reason for them to not have a tenancy and be a kitchen, you know, that they can prepare their own food. Uh, one of the experiences that we had this year, uh, which is a real heartbreaker too, is, is dealing with people who are hoarders in that setting, you know, that, 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 that uh, they just collect food and, um, and we, we don't put them out for that reason, but it's very hard to work with, with people and, and to kind of blaze a, a, a trail through the fruit flies that, that accumulate behind the food. You know, it's, I'm actually not kidding, you know, like, but, so, um, so that's something that we've been really challenged by this year because we, we we're not going to put them out for having a mental illness but at the same time we have a public health issue that we have to be careful about so so we definitely want to get permanent affordable housing but that issue is going to come back into play because you know when you establish tenancy then getting someone out of a of a building uh for that reason becomes a lot more complicated and then uh and, and now with all the evictions, see the moratorium in Massachusetts uh, on evictions ended in October, ended in October, uh, at the end of October. Then the FEMA, uh, sorry, the CDC moratorium is still in effect, but it doesn't have some, as much teeth to it. So we're anticipating that there's going to be a, a sort of groundswell of people because there's already at least uh, 1,500 evictions in Western Mass in the pipeline. So those, yeah, so those, the reason that was not happening so fast was first the moratorium, then the CDC moratorium, but also the, the, case, the, the courts weren't open. So, um, so everything had to be done by Zoom and things were moving at a snail's place, thank God. Thank God if you're a tenant, if you're a landlord, you're probably pulling your hair out saying, well, why is the bank not forgetting about my monthly payment when I'm not getting anything coming in? So it's a, it's a dilemma. But uh, yeah, so that that's 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 a challenge that we're all going to 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 have to work with. I spoke with an economist from the high school who's who's the contact person of liaison with the church. And he feels that the, we're we're looking at generations of of, of uh, financial distress uh, going forward. This is not something that we're just going to come out of and say, "Hey, hey team, it's over." It's it's not going to be over for a long time. The, we're going to feel the effects of this for many many years. Yeah, and if people think that you're going to solve the problem by simply putting people out of their houses because they haven't paid their rent, they're forgetting completely about the social instability that this is going to cause, you know, for everyone, including the children. Um, you know, that that is going to be a cost that lasts with those kids for the rest of their life, and then it is going to go down to their children. So... It's, it's not just money. It's also the social cost that people seem to be forgetting about in some, in some cases. Any other questions for Kat? I'm sorry, I'm looking for my charger. For Kevin. <laughs> I thought you were doing yoga. Oh no, I'm looking for my charger. <laughs> I thought it was time for to get up and do the dog down and sunrise, uh, sun, uh, sun salute. And uh, uh, I hope you find your charger. Too. Any other questions? Thank you both. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks, Kevin. Everybody. Thanks, Denise. Yes, you're yes, welcome. Sir.
Now I'll ask if, if there's someone here from uh, Valley CDC, you could raise your hand. Um, if not, I can, uh, the town's been working, partnering with Valley to administer the microenterprise assistance. I don't think there is anyone. Um, so I can say that, you know, we, um, the town had $140,000 um, in microenterprise assistance. Um, I think 20 of that was to ha have Valley administer, help administer it, you know, um, advertise it, provide income verification. You know, there's a lot of documentation for, an in for um, so microenterprise is five or fewer employees. That's also including the owner and it's not full-time equivalents. So if you have five uh, part-time people that only work 10 hours a week, that's that's as many as you can have. So it really is for microenterprise, it's very a very small uh, business. And so, um, you know, our, our goal was to help 12 to 15 businesses with grants of up to $10,000. Um, there's been some delay in administering or in getting those out. We've approved six so far. Um, it's a pretty big process. There's an online portal. Everything's online. Uh, you can mail in hard copies, but, um, you know, the state required a number of things, you know, a profit loss statement, um, taxes, income verification, a list of eligible expenses that a business would need to show to qualify. Um, you know, we asked for viability of the business, so a projection for the next year. And then, you know, docu they have to document, uh, you know, through their profit loss and numerically what they're, what they're eligible for, for the block grant. So, you know, through COVID, through our grant. So if they can only document $8,000 in impact, then they can only apply for $8,000. And so I think just the amount of paperwork and documentation that's required of this through the state, um, you know, I don't think there's been as many uh, completed applications as we thought. Uh, you know, also there's other state programs, there's the federal programs that don't require as much that offer more money so what the state, you know, and other communities have found this too, there's been round table discussions um, that probably a number of businesses actually applied to state funding and programs rather than the local program, just because it wasn't as arduous and um, they could get more money. So, you know, we're still confident that we can award grants to, you know, 12 or so businesses. Like I said, we have um, six or seven that have been already awarded and we have about six that are in their final steps of review. Uh, you know, the state has now, um, I think they've realized that communities are having a hard time. So they've actually increased the amount from 10,000 to 25,000 per business. Um, you know, the town, we're not going to make that adjustment because that would involve a whole program shift. You know, we have to then ask the businesses that were already approved and it just, you know, it, it's almost too late in our process to make, in my mind, to make that change just because we already are, you know, looking at 12 businesses. Um, but some communities as of, a, you know, a few weeks ago have, hadn't even given one award yet. You know, so they've been, you know, working on it for months and they still hadn't issued a grant or a, you can do it as a loan, but they hadn't issued any award yet just because it's been pretty complicated. The states made a few pretty big adjustments in their, in their program guidelines. And so that delayed it a bit um, in terms of what's eligible, you know, reimbursements, duplication of benefits. So it's been a lot to, to decipher, you know, the state hadn't really done a microenterprise program in a number of years, a few, only a few communities do it um, annually. And so the state kind of stopped doing it, I think probably about 10, 12 years ago. So this was a whole new program, uh, honestly, for many of the state reps and for towns. And so it was a learning curve. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're doing pretty good. It is disappointing that it takes so long. Um, you know, and we're, we're giving grants out to businesses so they don't have to, there's no worry about being paid back or anything. They just have to send in receipts uh, so that we can document that they spend it on eligible expenses. But I think just that whole, the whole process of documentation, they have to be income eligible and then have the loss and then show what's eligible in terms of COVID expenses is a lot for businesses. So, um, you know, I know some of them have to create their, you know, they don't have a profit loss statement, for instance, they can file taxes, you can do it depending on how big your business is, just with a form, you don't have to do a whole, you know, bunch of accounting, but to apply for this grant, essentially, you have to uh, do almost more work than you do for taxes. <laughs> and I think that's been a deterrent. And so I can take any questions if there's any from the committee. Let's ask a question about the, um, so you said the state is recommending $25,000 grants, but we're doing the $10,000. Right. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think what happened was about two weeks ago, 
the state sent out a survey asking any and all the communities doing microenterprise grants, you know, how's it going? And it must have been that most of the community said they weren't going, it wasn't going very well. So then the state responded and said, well, instead of capping the grants at 10,000, we can go up to 25,000 because I think the state wants the towns to spend the money. I think they're worried that, you know, come the end of this calendar year, there's going to be a lot of leftover money. And they, they expected the COVID money, the CARES money to be spent this calendar year. So, you know, we, you know, Valley and the town, we've agreed that through this calendar year, even if we keep it at 10,000, we'll be able to spend, you know, we'll be able to give that many grants out. So, you know, to do a program revision, it'd be at a local level. Right now, I think the 25,000 is a lot of money. And so, um, you know, because we've already given out six or seven grants, those grantees essentially could absorb the rest of the money. And not that it's a bad thing, but like I said, because we already have a pipeline of six or seven applicants who are now in the final review phases, it would just seem unfair to just cancel their applications, um, you know, just because we, we could. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the state was even allowing communities, they haven't yet, but there's been discussion about allowing communities to take money away from the micro program and put it into another program, which is not what they said at first too. I think they've realized that it's a, a difficult program to implement. So on that uh, topic, Nate, how much um, assistance is available for people if they're trying to fill out all these forms and get all the documentation together? Are they, is there, is there a lot available to them or? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'll, I'll thank the bid in the chamber, you know, they've been really helpful. The staff there is helping businesses, you know, Valley helps the businesses, but I do think that, you know, like Valley was saying, they almost are providing technical assistance in that respect. And then also doing the income verification income verification. And so, you know, they're doing probably more than they anticipated when we were envisioning this program. And so, you know, I do think that, like I said, the bid in the chamber have been really helpful, um, you know, to do that as well. So, you know, even like, um, you know, the, the profit loss statement or listing of eligible expenses is just something that, you know, how do you put a dollar figure on, you know, some people may not, you know, really have all that. Um, and it's all online too. So, you know, just having someone sit in front of the computer for a number of hours and upload documents can be, you know, like we've heard from tonight can be really difficult. And we just have a great process and that's why we were able to be awarding these grants in ways that other communities were not. Is that right? I think, I don't know if it's a great process. I see Cla Claudia is here from the chamber. <laughs> they may not think it's that great, but, um, I think Valley's been diligent, you know, so they follow up with the businesses quite a bit. Uh, sometimes I will. And so it's just a matter of, you know, um, you know, at one point we thought, okay, well, if, if someone, if a business applies, we'll have one follow-up phone call and one email follow-up, but in the end it might be, you know, dozens of follow-up phone calls and emails. And so it's not, you know, and I think even, you know, I'm helping with administering a rental assistance program and we're finding the same thing, you know, instead of spending maybe an hour on an application, it's hours to many phone calls. And so um, I think that's what's made it, you know, successful. Um, but it is, it is challenging. This way has required a lot. I think they're, they were being conservative. I think because of a program like this for a number of years, they were worried that communities might not do the right thing. And then when the state's audited, they were, I think, worried that they could be in trouble. And so they've been really conservative, like really strict about this. And so, um, so, you know, like other communities are just saying, well, like, especially if it's, you know, uh, a business owned by an immigrant or people who aren't familiar with anything, they're like, they're, they're not, they don't, they don't, they don't even complete an application and they're not interested, you know, um, especially if they're under the radar right now, all of a sudden we're asking them to give us like their tax identification number. They have to register with, a, um, with another federal database to record income and grants received. And it's asking a business to put themselves out a lot, which maybe, you know, they don't, you know, that maybe they're really uncomfortable doing that. They, you know, But, you know, we just, we did complete the survey and said, we can, you know, we're going to, we'll try to wrap it up by December. I think we'll be done. Actually, we're hoping to be done by July, actually, you know, have issued all our grants by July. All right, good. I'm, I'm off the hot seat. The, um, there, there are still members of the public here, so I, we can take uh, comments as well, if there's any public comments on the activities and what we've heard so far tonight. If people just want to raise their hands, we can acknowledge them to speak. 
Nate, if a fair number of people raised their hands, is it possible to let, give them a time limit so we can? Yeah, um, move yeah I don't. Yeah, I don't see anyone jumping at it. Um, so, but we can. I haven't installed it. I know that you know the town council and others. They have like a clock that they show in Zoom, so you can like show the countdown clock. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to install that. I just you know I've been I haven't got around to it. Um, so I don't see any hand raised. I think we could. I think there's one now. Uh, Claudia, you can unmute yourself and. Hi, hi Nate, hi everyone. Um, so I guess I just wanted to speak on, I just wanted to comment if that's okay since you mentioned me, <laughs> since the chamber and the bid were supporting the Pioneer Valley, um, the CDC. Uh, I just wanna say that that has been an enormous undertaking. Uh, businesses that love to cut your hair, love to prepare you a beautiful meal may not necessarily be very uh, computer savvy. So a lot of folks needed every single thing scanned, every single thing, you know, um, and then if it were questioned, it'd have to go back through email. Not everyone loves email. It, well, then we'd have to track people down through phone and then start a process over just for one form or one number on a form. Um, and another example would be a lot of people don't have formal leases. And so, and especially during COVID. So getting a letter, what does that letter look like? The state was, and you're right, uh, Nate, the, the CDC was very specific on very, you know, every word, everything had to be exact. And so it's just, it was quite a process to assist our businesses um, and to levels we never really understood either until we were all in it. <laughs> so I wanna thank everyone, but it's really been a challenge. Um, I'm actually really here to talk about Big Brothers Big Sisters, but I haven't heard them come up yet. I'm on their, I'm the uh, president of their advisory board. Sherry, I think, you know, I think we were done with comments on the uh, current activity so we can move to the priorities for the 2021 process. So I think, you know, Lev asked that as well in the, in the question and answer section. So I think, yeah, we can move on to comments there. So if people raise their hands, we can, um, we can just call on, on individuals to hear comments. So I can give my comment now on sure. Big Brothers Big Sisters? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Terrific. Um, so CHD is Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. I've been on their advisory board for over four years. I'm serving in my, going into my third year as board, uh, advisory board president. And uh, one of the things that has, um, firstly, I want to say that everyone here is not just doing uh, colossal work. It is Herculean work. Uh, it's just amazing. And we all partner with one another. We have worked with Laura. We've actually co- we have moved and co-located with Laura um, and, uh, you know, working with uh, Survival Center to get meals to our families that we serve that, of course, are served by the Survival Center. So we're all deeply, deeply interconnected. And I had the good fortune of working with some folks through COVID Cares Act to get some meals to um, uh, through um, <clears throat> Senior Center and um, through, uh, through some other programs so that we could get food to some of our neighbors while supporting restaurants. So it's just been an incredible undertaking and I'm so humbled by all the work that everyone does. Um, but I'm gonna give a pitch for Big Brothers Big Sisters because I know that children are really at risk right now. And I think in terms of isolation, I, th I think we know that in terms of what's coming down the road where is, is the unknown. And um, next year, the worry of, you know, our matches are probably needed more now than ever. Um, and I was touched listening to Dan Carey, representative in Hadley, and he was on the Student Opportunities Act and did a lot in education and you know meals, um, and, and that was a meals program. And one of the things that he was touching upon was that when we talk about um, this pandemic being over, that the new pandemic is going to be this mental health crisis and uh, that it's really going to be touching those kids. And those are the kids that come to us and into the mentorship program. So, uh, you know, we're feeling like this is going to be the most critical having a mentor in your life um, has proven for kids to be more successful in school, more successful as leaders, um, and uh, really proving that mentorship one-on-one -on -one, that we have been really uh, just sort of, it's just the highlight of what we do is we really honor that relationship and really support it. So I'm just really um, very nervous about next year. And I know a lot of folks are worried about funding. You know, there's been so much grant, avail grant funding available this year. Um, everyone's worried about, you know, the coming year as well. So as the need increases that the, that the um, 
some of the grant funding might be decreasing. Um, so I just want to say that I'm, I'm this this staff has worked incredible hours and it's just been <clears throat> monumental to try to keep the kids going on Zoom, you know, trying to keep those one on one relationships really about human connection. And this has all been about isolation. So again, what's going to happen as we all come back and come back to school? Uh, so that's really where I feel like this program is more critical than ever. So I just want to thank um, that staff too for everything they've done and how they've really held those matches together despite it all. And those kids are absolutely grateful and those parents to still have that kid touch point, even if it's been Zoom and there've been so many creative ways that they've reached out. So what I love about this program is it was able to pivot just like all the other programs that spoke kids doing cooking together over Zoom, right? Doing projects together over Zoom. So really um, came together in unique ways. And so it just shows their versatility and um, their ability to just make the matches their priority. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I have a question if, if that's okay. Sure. Great. Hi, Claudia. Hi, um, Mika. Do you have any sense of when you might go back to in-person um, conversations or whatever? Um, I believe that we are following BBSA of America standards. And I don't believe that that's um, before July. So I, 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 Jesse could uh, possibly um, clarify. I'm seeing if she can text me. <laughs> She's not texting me, but... Um, we we do have some standard guide, standards that we do follow, so we do follow theirs. Um, so I, it's probably going to be a little later, but it won't be before July. Oh, she raised her hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's she's in the audience, so she'll probably answer that when she should we get perfect. We get she'll clarify. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. Well. Um... The next uh, hand raise is Laura. You can unmute yourself. All right, I will keep it short and sweet because you've got lots of people and I bet everybody wants their dinner. So um, I will just say we need you know, housing support. Of course, of course we need housing support. That is what's going to be going on for this next year. And um, I will say that from all the families and individuals we work with, not it's not just helping folks apply for emergency funds, it's advocacy. And so um, I will leave it at that because I think you all know that. Thanks, Laura. The next person is, um, let's see, is uh, Judith. You can unmute yourself. I'm Judith Roberts from the Literacy Project. And um, first of all, I want to thank the committee for your past support. And I want to thank the shelters and also um, Amherst Survival Center because our students utilize those places and you guys have been great through this. In fact, we have a gentleman who got his GED with us while living in a congregate shelter in Amherst. So um, I think it was Craig Stores. Um, anyway, people are carrying on. So what we do is provide access to education for folks who didn't graduate high school and it gives them the tools to work their way out of poverty. Um, I think we were gonna, I have a student who made a short video on her phone, um, Nate, and we were gonna um, possibly try to put her video on the screen. Is that, do you remember we talked about it? Yeah, you, you, you have the video, right? Right. Yeah, so but let me we, just promote you to panelist, Judith. And I think now you can share your screen if, um, if if it, if it if you have it, okay, I'll I'll put if it share, up. If you share your screen, you have to open the video first, and then share your screen. Because... Okay, okay, right. Oh, and it's soft. We're not seeing the video yet. Oh, so how do I share my screen? I don't know. On the bottom of the screen, there's a little. Um, 
like a menu bar and it just there's a share screen button you could click on. Okay, hold on a sec. Uh, let's see. No. Um, share content. I think so, yeah. I'd have to. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Just hopefully it'll work now. Um, apologize for this. Um, can you guys see it now? No. Okay. All right. I don't want to take up the committee's time. If you, um, email, if you email me, Judith, if it's a file that can be emailed, I can always pull it up in a minute. Oh, okay, great. That'll be good. Um, meantime, um, is Yael um, Rosenblum here in the audience? Because she is a volunteer, um, six-year volunteer with the Literacy Project and resident of Amherst, and she was going to um, speak on behalf of the Literacy Project. So I'll give her... Yes, she's here. She's here right? yes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Yael and Rosenblum, and I volunteered for six years now at the Literacy Project. And um, every year is astounding. The students gain so much, not just in their reading and writing and math skills, but in terms of their futures. There's so much one on one attention given by both teachers as well as additional support and helping them think about their goals, helping them think about what their next steps are, what their strengths are, and then get them into programs both after, outside of the literacy project so they can build their capacities in their areas of interest so they can move forward in their life goals and career goals. Um, this year though has been astounding to see students who had never been on technology, had never had a computer, had an iPad and their, liter their technology literacy growth. And that's something that is enabling them to have greater success in all areas of their life because we've all become so dependent on it. And I have seen people who didn't have that before um, COVID, and now because it became part of the program by necessity, they're able to fill out forms more independently, and that is going to give them access into their th this day and age that we live in. Um, so along with all the learning that happens, both um, in typical years, the Literacy Project gave students the devices they needed this year, and that's going to have long-term effects and I think would be a wonderful place for them to get additional funding so they can continue to do that because it's necessary today um, for people to make it is to know how to get on Zoom meetings, how to fill out forms. Um, I also see, and I think that doesn't get seen because I've been there for so long, how teachers make sure students get small group support. And when a student has a desire, let's say one student this year um, wanted to get, become a certified nursing assistant and wanted to get into a program for that. So the, the school found a tutor who worked with him one-on-one -on -one during class time. And then also a volunteer who worked with him outside of class time um, so that he, could then apply to the program and actually get into the program. And soon he'll be graduating from the program. We got to see all this happen over the course of this past academic year. Uh, and we have other students too, who you know, are getting trained to do factory work and need math skills that are way above. And they're training, they're really, having tutors work one-on-one, -on -one, getting them up to speed so they can get into the programs at GCC or Holyoke. Um, so they provide a great community. The class bonding is really amazing and people are learning so much about 
um, those from other countries and what our history is that they're learning, but we're also learning so much about their countries. Um, so yeah, I just have to say it's a blessing to get to work with the students and with the teachers. The commitment is, you know, extremely, extremely strong and the community is just beautiful. And these, without this community, it would be really hard for people to thrive and move forward um, and get into programs that will give them the employment and passion and gifts to the world and to our local area. Thanks, uh, Judith emailed Thank me. You. I was gonna share the screen of the video. Oh, great. Um, if that's, is that visible for everyone? My name is Rohar. I am a student at the literacy project in Amherst. Uh, I joined this program in 2019 in order to become ready for college. This program has helped me to improve my English, my math skills, as well as my knowledge in other areas. The literacy project is uh, not only about college preparation. Here you will have also the opportunity to join a great and supportive uh, community. Thank you very much, the Literacy Project, for making it possible for us to achieve our educational goals. Thanks, right. Nathaniel. Sure, thanks, Judith. All right, if, there's, if there are any questions or comments, we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks, Ayel. Thanks, Judith. Uh, Lev, you're, um, you can speak. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, in thinking about priorities moving forward, um, I just really can't say enough about the other folks who are also speaking tonight. And I think that's one of the kind of uh, consistent messages that the committee is hearing is the combined impact that becomes possible through effective coordination of a variety of organizations and supporting individuals and families on the different levels that they need that help. Um, and so we've already you've heard a little bit of the ways that organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters or Healthy Hampshire have stepped up to deliver groceries. Um, the level of support that family outreach has provided, certainly in connecting people with the MR Survival Center, but all of their other support to other essential services that they're providing, Craig's doors, round the clock, shelter access and support services. Um, so when I think about this kind of set of combined priorities moving forward, I really encourage the committee to consider this need for temporary housing and shelter and supports for people in experiencing homelessness, this really significant need around case management, youth development, and family support. Um, and then certainly from my role, I voice a strong advocacy for food and nutrition to continue to be a top priority for the upcoming CDBG application process. Um, and I think it's essential that all of this has a focus on accessibility for our diverse communities across Amherst, quality and impact. Um, but speaking specifically to food insecurity, Unfortunately, what we know is that the economic fallout of this crisis will continue long after we have the physical health risks under control. Um, food insecurity has risen rapidly, uh, roughly 50% in Hampshire County this year, which comes out to one in eight county residents. Um, but poverty and food insecurity are more than twice as high in Amherst at um, than the county as a whole. So potentially as many as 25 to 30%. And so there are both more people that are struggling and the challenges that are faced are deeper. So this economic fallout continues, even kind of once this immediate public health threat is over, we're, as we've seen in previous recessions, as low wage workers, people of color, folks who are undocumented, um, people with less formal education, um, English language learners, that they will be hit the hardest and for the longest. Uh, so 
I won't reiterate any of the ways we've talked to as well, and the committee is aware of, kind of actions that the Amherst Survival Center has taken. Um, but I really appreciated what Kevin was sharing earlier about the viability and improved impact of housing people in motels. And I would echo that learning that has happened through the pandemic. We have also built a new model for the food pantry that is serving more people, that is serving them much better, much more effectively with more access and um, increased food. And so, sorry. Um, and so really believe that now is an important time for a continued investment in the food security of Amherst, as opposed to uh, letting up on that when all of these other funding sources are going to dissipate because I fear creating conditions where we really further the divide in this recovery process. And I just wanted to share an anecdote. Um, we got a call a couple months ago from a mother who was new to Amherst and she had just received her first delivery from the food pantry. And it included all of the regular food um, and included diapers and wipes and extra kid-friendly groceries and snacks. And the next day after the delivery, she called us and thanked us and said that her the shelves in her kitchen pantry had more on them than they had had in years. And that she was so touched that there was an organization like this here in Amherst that was supported by the community, that the community created this support and that it made her feel really welcome in a new town. And I just, it, that sentiment was so touching to me and I just think it's really beautiful to get to work in this coordinated fashion to welcome families like this into our community and make sure that people are taken care of and so I really want to uh, encourage the committees or I appreciate your consideration of food security as a, a high CDBG priority for this upcoming year uh, because unfortunately I think the needs will continue to be really great. Thank you. Thank you, love. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is uh, Jesse. Thanks, love. Hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Cooley uh, from Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. So good to be with you all. And I echo love's sentiments and what others have shared tonight about the importance of all of these programs. It's always so powerful to hear from you. Um, and I, this year has shown us more than ever the amazing dedication um, and power in this community and the innovation that everyone has shown in continuing to serve our, our clients. And many of us work with the same families and the same children in the community. It's really meaningful to us at Big Brothers Big Sisters that we can work together and collaborate with all of these great programs. Um, and thank you to the committee for your support. Um, we are always honored to be grantees. Um, Thank you, Andrew, for all your work on the committee. Best wishes to you. We had a great site visit recently with me and Ben. Um, so, and I know that you all have heard from me a lot, so I won't go on and on, um, but just to advocate for youth services to continue being a priority um, in the next round of CDBG funding. As Claudia mentioned, we're just really seeing the impact on young people and their families um, from all of the remote learning um, or just all different kinds of hybrid learning. It's really had a traumatic effect on so many young people. I was just at a meeting before this one where a lot of um, young folks were sharing that story with um, some of the youth programs in the area. And it's something that we continue to hear from our colleagues in the school. I had a meeting earlier this week with our partners at the ARPS Family Center. They're the ones that we typically apply for grant funding in collaboration with. So our wait list is growing of young people who are hoping to be matched with mentors in the coming year. And we know that even though we can't reverse the impact of what happened this year, um, as with all trauma, the research shows that um, a mitigating factor for the impact of trauma is one of the mitigating factors is the presence of a caring, supportive adult in someone's life, that it actually um, lessens the overall long-term negative impact of trauma. And that's something that's so powerful and we really hold on to that when we're working to match more kids with great mentors. Um, our staff has worked incredibly hard this year, as Claudia said, and it's taken longer to support each match and really take things case by case and see how people feel safe. So 
um, Rika, just to answer your question from earlier, um, you know, as the weather improves and CDC regulations change and all of this, we're certainly following all of the public safety guidelines and also speaking with, with each family, with each child, with each volunteer to make sure that we can come up with a good plan for them to get back to in-person visits because everybody misses that. There are some people who don't feel comfortable yet. Of course, most of the children can't be vaccinated yet, so that's a factor. Um, but we're just taking it case by case and supporting them and um, hoping that they can get outside for lots of outdoor safe activities, which some of them have been starting to do, which is awesome. And we're waiting to see what all the, you know, what the colleges and the university decide. That'll determine some of our programming in the coming year, but we have learned to be patient and wait for information. <laughs> That's our plan. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jesse. Nate, are you, are you with us? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just lowering the shades. So, uh, you know, everyone walking down the street can't look into my bedroom and see me. <laughs> What's wrong with that? You're dressed. I, I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> From the waist up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, yeah, I have shorts on. I don't have my nice pants on anymore, but still have shorts on. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Um, yeah, I think the, um, you know, about reopening at yeah, the town halls and is reopening just because of the government orders in June, but there's still, you know, a lot of uh, caution there. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, we had planned on a fall opening and I think probably many organizations are planning something similar. So, you know, even though, some restrictions are easing. I think it's going to be a few months of transition. And so I don't, you know, as you know, I think most of the organizations have made it work, they've pivoted. And so we're, you know, I, I think it's a good question. I think that, you know, the block grant um, program hasn't, you know, doesn't ask that. So it's funny in their 21 paperwork, they, they really don't mention the pandemic. It's almost like uh, back to business as usual. They have the same one year plan and they haven't, change priorities or said anything, you know, whereas with the CARES money, they're pretty clear. Um, they had priorities, they outlined some on their own, you know, they have this kind of standard priorities for the 21 process. So it is kind of interesting to see that. Um, uh, Jesse, I'll, I'm going to, uh, there's one more speaker. So um, have you just, uh, you can go back to the audience. Um, Caitlin, you can unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, this is Caitlin Marquis from Healthy Hampshire, and I'm so thrilled to be able to speak after Lev, who just spoke so much to definitely what's on my heart and, and in my mind um, about priorities. Um, I'm here representing the Amherst Mobile Market, which is um, one of our projects, and, and we did submit an application in the last round of CDBG uh, funding, and um, or the current round, I guess, as the case may be. Um, and I just want to point to and appreciate um, all of the questions in the RFP about the extent to which the community is engaged in um, decision making about the programs that are uh, applying for CDBG funding, because I really think that is um, what sets the Amherst mobile market apart. Um, we are so thrilled to partner uh, with organizations like the Survival Center and Family Outreach, and I wholeheartedly agree with everybody here um, that it takes all of these programs and it's really hard to suss out priorities because it is such an interlocking uh, sort of um, constellation of, of wonderful programs that support people in Amherst. Um, and you know the Survival Center, we, we help, as Lev mentioned, with the monthly pantry deliveries, which is, I think, a tremendous support to people. And at the same time, um, you know, people uh, need access more often than that, more frequently than that. And I think one of the really special things about the Amherst Mobile Market, which visits uh, four different communities in Amherst, all of which have um, high rates of factors that point to food insecurity, um, high rates of, of families that don't have access to vehicles. Um, you know, we operate during the summer months um, when the bus system in Amherst is actually not as robust as it is during the school year even. So it's even harder for people to get to the grocery stores. So um, we're really focused on bringing that fresh, healthy produce to people 
uh, where they are once a week um, and where they can use their uh, federal benefits and, and state benefits like the SNAP program and the HIP program to access really affordable um, produce. And the really beautiful thing about it is um, all of the folks who are employed by the market are, you know, they, they sort of started out just in a planning process with us um, representing the voices of, of themselves and their community as, as food insecure residents or residents experiencing food insecurity. Um, I, I also have a video that I would love to share, but it is a little bit long. It's six minutes and I know that you're tight on time. So I won't, um, I won't monopolize your time with that, but I would encourage you to check out our website, www.amherstmobilemarket.com. Um, and the, the video I just love so much because um, it features the voices of the folks who are employed by the market and really um, getting to um, experience the market as an opportunity to develop themselves and their leadership um, and their voices and their ability to support their own communities. Um, so I really encourage you to check that out. I think it really speaks to some of the values that were communicated through the RFP. Um, and I just want to definitely lift up um, food insecurity as a, a priority. Um, and just thank you so much for your time and for listening and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Caitlin. I don't see any any questions from the committee. Um, so if there's, you know, I'll just we can put a call out for one last some last comments. Then we'll close the public hearing and we'll move on to the public meeting. Uh, there is a question in the audit from the um, in the question and answer function asking when um, when proposals will be due for the 21 process. That's something the committee's uh, talking about next. But um, you know, the town's grant is due to the state September 10th. And so, um, you know, I've already suggested that we have a schedule and that the proposals to the committee would be due at the end of July or early August. And so uh, that's something we're gonna talk about next, but you know, we'd try to get the proposals available in a month. They'd have, you know, four weeks to be completed and then due and then the usual, you know, review and public meeting, public hearing. Um, like I said, we're not given a huge timeline, but I think that's something you know, I'll, it'll be on the committee webpage. If we finalize dates, it'll be on the committee webpage tomorrow and I can email out everyone this week or next week, you know, with all the timeline and everything. I think if, I think we're done with comments. I think we will need a motion to close the hearing and then we can move to the public meeting piece. Uh, I'll make the motion. Anybody want a second? A second. All right, so just to be clear, we do have, have to have a roll call vote because it's um, through, uh, through Zoom. So just if everyone wants to, uh, yeah, you can just call the members out and they can just say yes or no that, if they want to close the hearing. Uh, Andrew, would you like to close the hearing? Yes. Uh, Lucas, would you like to close the hearing? Yes. Matt, would you like to close the hearing? Okay. Paul? Yes. And Becky, was she the second? Was she? Okay. Oh, yes, I'll say yes anyway. Okay, Enrica? Yes. Thank you. All right, great. So the public hearings closed. Um, so for the public meeting, you know, we had on the agenda just discuss the comments we heard and then lay out a schedule. Um, you know, I was going to share the uh, my screen. You know, these are the social service priorities we had. Uh, from the fall, you know, household and you know, household, family, and individual stabilization, support services for those experiencing homelessness, youth development, economic self-sufficiency, food and nutrition, health services, uh, and insurance navigation, support services for seniors, and then other. So we had a pretty, pretty wide list. Um, you know, there was some discussion of, um, you know, we, I think every year we do, we talk about, you know. Uh, ranking these or having weight to these, but I think we've usually decided not to. That they, you know, they all have, um, you know, they all have a priority, and so some some of it is the way then the committee members review the proposals, um, and then I think um, you know we also discuss, you know, do we? Uh, we've also discussed from uh, each year, do we 
um, uh, reduce someone's ability to apply if they've received funding in consecutive years. You know, so that's something that um, has been discussed. And so, you know, as a mini, I say, as a mini entitlement community, the state has already predetermined Amherst having uh, the need in the community. You know, we have um, being a mini, they say we have, you know, uh, unemployment, poverty, and certain statistics that warrant need. So they don't, you know, they don't require us to do that. It'd be a local decision. The state themselves have certain requirements, but, you know, uh, Amherst, we don't. So I think um, you know, those are things that can be discussed um, tonight, or, you know, we could go to the a meeting schedule, but I think, you know, these are the, the, um, the social service priorities. I'm just going to do a new share in terms of, um, Um, did I hit new share? Okay, yeah. Um, this is the, the, we also require to target our non-social service priorities. And so last year we had, uh, this is what we had three target areas, one being the town center in red, the East Village Center in uh, orange, and then the Pomeroy Village, East Alley Road area. And I don't know if that's what, what color that looks like to you, maybe purple. Um, and so we can't have probably more than three target areas. You know, the state would probably like us to only have two, but I think we can get away with three. Um, you know, all the rules as in the past apply. We, we can't fund more than five social services uh, activities in the grant. And then this year, they're gonna be a little stricter with um, not allowing the town to fund more than three non-social service activities outside the social services. So. Um, you know, so for instance, if the town applies with a few projects and then Valley CDC has something and housing authority and whom, you know, however many we receive, we can only recommend or fund three uh, non-social service activities. So that'll be, um, you know, I think it'll be competitive for both non-social service and social service this year. Um, so I think, you know, for the committee, my thought is, you know, we have to um, you know, we could keep the priorities we, we developed in the fall based on comments tonight. Um, we could tweak them a little bit. We could tweak the target areas. Um, and so I think, you know, as a kind of a fluid conversation, I guess my next thought would be just to schedule the, uh, I think scheduling a, a, the meetings the next few months would be helpful. And so just because, you know, um, it's getting kind of late tonight. My thought is we'd have another meeting in June to review these priorities and the request for proposal document. You know, I was suggesting sometime in mid June and then having those proposals be ready to be issued in late June, early July. And then if we want applicants to have four weeks to respond, you know, that puts the due date, um, you know, end of July, early August. And then my thought was, you know, the committee could hold a, a public meeting to prioritize proposals like August 12th and then hold a public hearing the following week. Uh, we're required to hold a public hearing to um, allow the public to comment on the recommended activities in the grant. And then, um, you know, that gives us, um, you know, three weeks to uh, get the application going. So you know, we could probably hold the hearing a little later and push the, the 12th and the 19th back a bit, but it does take about two, two weeks uh, to get an application ready for the town, you know, for myself and Ben to actually prepare an application. So there isn't, you know, I don't want to say there isn't any wiggle room, but this is, I don't like the schedule. And unfortunately the state said they might keep it this way. I think doing this over the summer is kind of tough. August, you know, people are away, I'm away at, in, uh, late June and late August. So um, I don't know about everyone else's vacation schedule, but you know, we, we have, um, with the exception of Andrew, we have six members. Um, so we, we only need four to have a quorum. Not that I want, you know, to advocate for, um, um, you know, members missing meetings, but if they're recorded, uh, you know, you, we can attend them remotely. And then if they're recorded, we can always view, if a member views them before the next meeting, they can uh, participate if it needs to have a vote or some recommendation. So I don't know what people think first, if we want to discuss the comments or try to set out a schedule and then discuss comments, just so we know if we need another meeting. And committee members, you can just probably unmute yourself and you can just have a conversation. It's hard to raise hands all the time, but. Well, it seems to me that the scheduling is probably 
paramount because it's so tight. And so I think the summer is going to probably be pretty rough for everybody. I mean, I, I'm not going anywhere, but I have one day that I cannot do in late June, uh, which is the 23rd. Um, I think so. I don't know how everybody else feels, but that's, that's where I'm at. Um, Nate, Nate, while we're having this conversation, can you stop sharing? Because I, okay. my Zoom isn't working, so I can only see one person at a time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm fine moving to scheduling also. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I'm fine moving to scheduling, but I do think we need to have a conversation about priorities at some point. So, but that's, we're planning on that being one of the dates, correct? Yeah, my thought is if we have another meeting in June, we can talk about priorities and review the RFP document uh, too. So I forgot what I said in my email exactly, uh, what date, um, but I think it was um, like June, I don't know, like the week of June 14th or something I suggested. I don't know if there's a good date for anyone you know, we don't have to meet, I think, given the schedule, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we used to meet like on a Thursday evening, but if a Monday or Wednesday, I mean, I would just be, I, would, um, I think we can be flexible um, as you, long as members can Do you meet. think it's e easier if going forward, we just have one weeknight that becomes a designated night for all the meetings till the end of the process so that people just have it in their brain or that does that not work for you, Nate? Um, I think just given the schedule, I think, you know, I would, I don't mind moving them around. We post it online. I can let everyone know, but um, we could try to say one night, but I think, um, I think it's hard, you know, I mean, myself included, I, I am usually meeting every Wednesday night with something else. I have baseball practice a few times a week with my kids. And so, I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> I, I would just, you know, if we can nail down a date the week of June 14th, then we can just, you know, I would say, okay, that let's dedicate that meeting to this purpose. And then we can just go to the next one and see how that works. Um, can, I don't know how people feel about, you know, that week is mid June. I'd like to put out there June 17th. That's yeah, a Thursday. Just yeah. The second half of the month, I'm having surgery on June 1st, getting a new shoulder. So I'll be home, but probably feeling better by the second week and after. So the 14th, 17th, that's fine. 17th is good for me. That works for me. Oh, yeah, because I'm, I'm going on vacation the following week, so. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it's my husband's birthday. <laughs> Uh, we have to talk about priorities, Gail. Um, <laughs> it's a big one, too. I can't say the age, but it's a big one. Uh, Has the 35. <laughs> the second time, almost. Um, I could, that week, I'm free. To, I have a board meeting on Monday. So I could do Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. I don't know if that works for anybody. Tuesday's Better my birthday. We can, we can all celebrate together. Oh, that. <laughs> that's fun for you. <laughs> okay, or are we going? Are we going to do Wednesday? I'm gonna. I think I'm in a meeting on Wednesday that I can't miss um, Wednesday evening. I can't be there Tuesday, but it sounds like we can't have everyone. So, and Gail's the chair. So, what about okay, well, what about Wednesday? Does that work better for people? Wednesday, the um... isn't that the day that you have a meeting you can't miss? Well, you know. I can, it, gives a, it gives you enough time to talk with staff. Are our meetings always at seven? They don't, they don't have to be. I mean, they could be at like 6.30 or six. I think, um, you know, seven, usually we'd have them in the evenings. Just, you know, if everyone was working, if people aren't remote, it's just, you know, seven would give people enough time to get there after work or. Are we thinking this will be in person? Um, no, I think it's been extended to, uh, until September. So I think originally they thought June, by June 15th, it would be in person, but I, I, I read something I thought this week that said the governor is extending it or proposed legislation to extend it to September 1. Would anybody be opposed to six o'clock on the 16th? I'm just throwing it out there. I, per, I would prefer I, seven. I prefer seven. Okay. And I was gonna say, what about the ninth? Is that too soon after the surgery? Yeah, that would be too soon, I think. I mean, I'm not sure. Hopefully, it won't. It wouldn't be, but you know, I don't want to schedule something that then I can't be at. So if we said June 16th, which is Wednesday, 
at seven. I think that's I think that's all right. So you know, my thought is for that evening we would have to finalize priorities, the target areas, and then also the RFPs. And you know, we I think the committee we looked at those those documents, the RFP documents last fall. So I don't know how much you know tweaking we need to do. I think we made some good changes, but um, if we think that's possible in one night, um, then we can you know we can schedule just to June sixteenth. Great. So finalized priorities um, and the other two items were? At priorities, target areas, and then just the actual, you know, our, the request for proposal document itself. Um, okay. Oh, right. And I mean, given that we did this like six months ago, I can't imagine that there'd be too, too much change necessary. I mean, Becky talked about priorities. A discussion. I, yeah, and I can just say right now, the one priority that I'm just thinking about, um, just because it's so much what it seems like everybody is talking about all the time, are, are racial equity issues. And I don't know what, whether that is something that, I don't know if that's ever been a priority issue for it, like in the list of priorities or anything like that. Um, but that certainly seems to be where so much of the focus in Amherst right now certainly is in, in talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good suggestion. Okay. I'm sorry. There were three finalized priorities. Re review RFP. What was the third thing? Uh, target areas, and then a, a, th a fourth one I came up with was the review criteria. So you know, within the RFP, we have how the committee will review proposals, and we have a kind of a, a, a list of uh, things. And so um, I think we modified a few last time in terms of what we're asking for in terms of. Um, um, like financial statements and then a few things, but you know, we always want to, I just want to make sure we just hit the review criteria again. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that would be a full evening. You know, the benefit, if we can, if we wrap all that up in one evening, then we could issue the request for proposals. Um, you know, I mean, I could probably, we could probably get them out on the 18th of June then. So it's pretty early. Uh, which actually is nice because then we could actually, you know, maybe we have a little more time at the end, right? If we, if we say, okay, let's shoot for June 18th on Friday to get them publicized and we have uh, a four week or five week turnaround, we could, um, I was just looking at a calendar. Yeah, Cause I think what we did, what we've started doing is uh, we did it last year. I think it was the second time is, you know, we'd, have proposals be due. I get them that we get them to the committee that same day. Um, if you want paper copies, let us know. Ben was happy to drive around last time. <laughs> but we uh, appreciated it, or I appreciated yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. And no, uh, yeah, oh, my I eyes are tired it. of being on the computer so much, but that's just the way it is right now. Um, but then you know, the committee was we allowed time for the committee to generate questions of the applicants, and then we would send those to the applicants, and then they would respond, and that was part of the review process before the meeting where the committee prioritized uh, and ranked proposals. I think that's a really good step. It's something that we hadn't done. But I think it helps, you know, uh, with verifying proposals and helping the committee with the recommendations. So, you know, that being said, if, if we can get the proposals out in June 18, um, you know, they could be due, uh, you know, like the week of July 19th or something like we, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know what, how many weeks we want to give people to respond. Mm -hmm. We think four is enough or. I think we, because of the 4th of July, that's, that's a big holiday vacation. Uh -huh. You should give them five. Well, the, if we did, if we gave them the 23rd is four weeks, but right with the holiday, if we said like Tuesday, the 27th, that gives them another weekend. Um, and then that gives, I'm just trying to give you committee then enough time. You know, if we said, okay, if they're due on the 27th, committee have your questions to me by Tuesday the 3rd, uh, August 3rd. And then if we ask applicants to get the comments back by Monday the 9th, we had a meeting on the 12th, that would, you know, that would give you enough time to see the responses from the applicants. We think that's a good schedule. Tight, but I think we could do it. That works yeah, it great for a nice summer yeah. schedule. Yeah, yeah, works very well I, for me. 
Yeah, I'm away the last week of July, so that'll be kind of tight for me, but I'll me, do my I'm, best. I'm, I'm in the same position, but I think it will work for me. Yeah, so I, yeah, I forgot what I said. Proposals due the 27th. Question Questions yes. by the 9th. 9th. Meeting on and the then 12th. We, and we would meet the 12th. Sorry, our questions are eight by the third, responses yeah. by the ninth, and we meet on the 12th. Yeah, I think, okay. We can we can always just, you know, touch on it again at the next meeting. Um, so, you know, if people are away that last week in July, we could we could say that, I mean, we don't have to, if, if um, we could have the meeting the following week on like the 17th on August, Tuesday, the 17th. And that could give everyone, you know, maybe, um, you know, you don't, I don't have to have committee comments until like the six or something, or, you know, a little later, just giving everyone a few more days. Does that make it really tight? I always ask this question. Does it make it really tight for you in the end though? Well, let's see if we actually, let's see. Well, let's just say if we had, have to get them to the town manager. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we met on the 17th and we, the committee could um, recommend everything in one evening, we still could have, we could hold a public hearing on August 26th or so, or something like that Thursday. And um, I think that would work. And that gives us one, uh, you know, two, uh, it's like, a little over two weeks to get it done, but if Ben and I are both working on it, I think we can do it. So the RFPs would still be due on the July 27th. And then the thought would be maybe committee members don't have to provide me comments until, um, you know, we could say like Friday, August 6th. Is that better for people? Or is that still a hard, you know? A week and a half. It's a little bit more, right? We could say Monday the 9th. The sixth is fine, I think. Yeah, I, I think if it gets too long, then. <laughs> okay, give me a question. Behind. Okay. So committee questions by the sixth. Applicants respond by, um, we said like um, the 12th, by August 12th. And then we have the meeting on the 17th. And you get us the responses before the 17th, correct? Right, so I would ask that they that all respond by like noon on the 12th and then by the end of the day on the 12th, the responses would be sent to you or we could, you know, we need to drive them or something. And then on the 17th is the date we would make the recommendations. That would be our deliberation meeting? Yes. Okay. And then August 26th, I think, I said was the public hearing to um, on the recommended activities, and I think that's yeah, that's not the twenty um, seventh. When was the when was the um, public meeting? Yeah, um, twenty six. Twenty six is a Thursday. Um, yeah, so I think that I mean if that works for everyone, that's probably as good, you know, I, I, yeah, I think that's all right for me. I think school actually starts on the 26th this year. They start, it starts early this year. So I, I won't be aware. I don't think it starts that early. I think. Oh, is it pushed um, back a little bit? Well, I just, <laughs> I know that volleyball tryouts start on the 25th and that usually is the week before. <laughs> they usually have sports tryouts the week before right. school starts. So I think school might start the 30th. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah, if things are happening with school, then I, usually we try to take the last few days of summer off and do something, but, if, you know, so I think that's the schedule. If we can always move things a day or two, you know, but um, that's, I think a good general layout. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. I can email that out and put it online. And then Ben will be helping out too. So, you know, if I'm not here, Ben can be here, or vice versa. This we can have the process move forward. We just can't be away on the same day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, with Zoom, I could, like Andrew did it, I could be on vacation. And that's yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we, can, we can talk about the comments tonight too. I think we've, uh, thanks for the schedule. I think that's really nice to have, have something laid out. Um, 
you know, and I think like I said, we can only find, you know, we fund five maximum of five social services and three non-social services. So it makes it easy and hard at the same time because we then have to, you know, decide between and recommend proposals, but. Um, and Becky, I, I hear your comment um, about priorities. Um, where's my notes? There. Um, I think the, um, yeah, I think it's good to talk about it. I think it's good to talk about, um, you know, the priorities for social service and the priorities for non-social service. So for non-social service, we've said in the past few years, you know, to implement the master plan and um, in these village centers, you know, to increase accessibility and other things. And it's been, it's been fine. I don't, um, you know, if we wanted to refine that, we could. And then, like I said, I shared what the social services were. We had about seven kind of broad categories. And, you know, if it's worth narrowing that down, at one point it was a discussion about, you know, would we, would the committee have fewer priority, social service priorities and then rotate funding based on those priorities. So it's like, you know, the next year we'd rotate the priorities somehow. And, you know, I think it becomes a big discussion if we want to start doing, doing something like that. Like, you know, if we said, okay, we're only gonna have th two priorities this year. And then that is ways, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, would give those proposals, you know, in that category more, you know, a, a, a higher ranking. And, um, you know, I think sometimes that can get hard to do. Uh, so, you know, we're not necessarily, I don't, you know, I don't know necessarily want to preclude an applicant from submitting something, so. I don't know if there's any thoughts on that or. I, th I think that when we do that, it may make the decision-making process easier because we're limiting, we're having a limited number of applications, but it's so hard to say, well, this year we're gonna do two. And then what if the next year we go to do two, but the need is still greater in the two we did the year before. So I think that that's a tough part of limiting. <laughs> Anybody else? Feels like a really um, big decision for us to make to say that we were going to limit, you know, and I don't know how you, I don't even know after hearing those, just a few presentations tonight, how you would even make those kinds of decisions mm -hmm. without hearing more from the community really about what their priorities would be. I think right, I'd I also think less it inclined limits to do us. that. Oh, sorry, Becky. No, I was just saying I'd be less inclined to do that, I think. I mean, I'm, I know I'm new doing this, but it feels, I think I'd rather limit it by the, see everything that comes in and, and go from there rather than limit really who would be applying. Yeah, I, I think there might be enough stress on the situation as it is. <laughs> um, you know, they all seem to be working together. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I see this as sort of a functionality of making sure people are vetting and we're dotting all the, I's and crossing the T's, but uh, you know they seem to know what you know they seem to know what they're doing, and they seem to work well together, and they seem to have everything pretty well under control in the area. So I don't know if we really want to throw a wrench in it this year. Yeah, I would I would add that I think it just cuts down our flexibility as to what things are current are happening at the time if we've made a decision so far in advance about the particular priorities. Good point, Rico. Can you raise some questions as far as how we did it? If, if we, I mean, what are we going to do? Tell some people they can't apply, or they didn't get approved, and then they're going to appeal that? I mean, it, it gets into a whole, it gets into a mess, I think, if, if we try to uh, prioritize based on who's gotten money in the past. That's all. Yeah, I'm not advocating for it one way or the other. I just think it's something to discuss just because I know it, you know, right. it can help shape how we prioritize proposals or what we put out there. So discussion is never bad. Yeah. I mean, some communities will be very clear about that, <laughs> surprisingly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, that's fine with me. Um, you know, I don't, you know, Becky, you brought up the racial equity. I don't know if, that, if we want to have that as a priority, if we want to add that. Um, I was, let me just share my screen to show what we did have. Um, Rika, hopefully your computer 
um, you can see it. Um, so yeah, here, here are the, uh, what we have, you know, what we had for the fall, you know, household, like, you know, we have the, I guess like two, we have seven, but the ability to add other. <laughs> and so Nate, isn't this what we we're discussing at our next meeting? It can be. I mean, we could talk about it tonight. It's nine o'clock. I don't know how committee members feel if we want to, you know, have give, give ourselves like 10 more minutes or, and then we can always finish it up. Um, or if there's any other questions we could have just to be thinking about for the next meeting. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, these, you know, this type of thing, uh, these categories, like I said, those target areas. Um, and I can email out the, these documents too, just so we have them all. It's the one other, um, and I'm not necessarily advocating for any of these. I think I'm just saying that we should talk about them. But after hearing what, what a lot of people were talking about tonight, that sort of mental health is going to be the next pandemic, I wonder if that would be another thing to consider having as a specific activity or mental health services. Oh, man, that's a big one. Yeah. I mean, I see it as youth development. You know, that's a, that's the one I see is, is sort of that. That's what that's sort of the stopgap in there. But you know, right? I mean, I think it certainly can be assumed to be part of a lot of these. It would just be whether it makes sense to have one, you know, on its own. And I guess I think of adding things more just to give people the idea of applying. People maybe organizations that haven't thought of applying before, or are newly created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think the other, I think that's why we've, we've always left the other in there just so that, you know, it does show the ability to, to say, um, you know, it's, you know it's, it's fine. This reminds me of like a question you get and you're like, choose the one that best fits. And you're like, well, geez, I think I could do two of these. Um, <laughs> but you really, you're only supposed to do one. So, um, uh, but yeah, um, so I think, we, yeah, it's interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting idea that, you know, if we say it, if we say, um, say mental health, does it right? Does it allow other agencies to consider what, you know, how they frame their proposal or how they categorize it? Yeah, that's what I wondered. That that's a way you could approach it, right? If you want to come in on mental health, how are what you doing? How is that impacting that? Mm -hmm. it, so it isn't that you're necessarily a mental health agency, right. but you do things. The other thing I was going to say about racial um, equity or racial justice is we're also going to talk about review criteria which it seems like that would be a place that could fit as well, or at least we could talk more about that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it's important to name um, the two priorities that Becky suggested, suggested just to show that we're um, as a committee aware of what's coming down the pike and not just to stick to the priorities that we've more or less had in the past. I think it supports organizations that are doing work in this realm. And it would be nice to see some new applicants too. I, 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 we can only see a little bit of this form, but I'm curious. Are the review criteria something that is an in, is internal to us, or is that also? I was just typing some notes. The um, it's uh, it's it can be local. Then it's also there's also the state level. So you know the state asks that every um, activity meet a national objective. You know essentially it serves lower moderate income. It has to be consistent with community priorities, um, and then they ask for you know, some agency information, a project budget, and then, you know, they want a project description that has a number of bullet points, you know, project need, community involvement and support, uh, project feasibility, again, with a number of sub points, project impact. And um, so some of these are local and some of these are state. And I was just, I, one of my notes was just to go compare what the state, some, some um, I think last year, maybe this year, they're gonna update some of their, what they wanna see in a proposal. So then we would just kind of tweak, you know, some of these, but, you know, for instance, locally, we could say, okay, let's, if we want to see more in terms of impact or, you know, what, you know, if we want to see something else in here, we could add a bullet or, so that's, you know, for next meeting, I, I can send these out in Word documents and we can look at them to see, 
and we have that review kind of table we use. So, you know, there's like the, these are put in a table format with proposals, you know, the, the activities and we can, it becomes a comparative review table. So that, that can be sent out. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, the state hasn't, um, I can stop the share. The state, you know, um, they're big on project feasibility last year. I think they were finding that many activities were uh, taking longer than the 12 to 18 months they initially said. So they were putting an emphasis on, um, you know, capacity and feasibility. I think they're gonna carry that over to this year. So they wanna see that, you know, especially for the capital projects or non-social services that everyone you know, has already started permitting or knows what the permitting steps are or has you know, an architect or plans. And um, you know, for social services, they just wanna, I think, see that they have, they have experience doing it and they have like, you know, a clear outline of you know, staff or methodology to implement the program. Um, but I, you know, I, I went through their one-year plan and everything, and I haven't seen any big changes. So I was, I mean, I, like I said, I, that was my note to myself while you guys were talking. I think it was a good point to say, okay, are there something the state's throwing in there this year that we need to be aware of? Um, so I think, you know, it's 9.08. I don't know if there's any other, um, to any other comments, but I think, you know, I can send a, a number of things out. And we, Ben and I can update the website so everyone knows the schedule, tentative schedule. And Andrew will uh, send you a cupcake through the mail. Uh, and now, back by one last time by popular demand, <laughs> and uh -huh. to, I promise to give her the, the pass on the cupcake, okay? <laughs> Very nice. And uh, Paul, good luck with your shoulder surgery. Thanks. It's a, it's a little weird. It's a total shoulder. Oh, wow. That's yeah. So and hopefully you won't be calling me lefty. <laughs> well, I know the joint technology is amazing now in general. So good luck to you and Gail to your twice 35 hubby. Not, not, not really, that. just close to twice. <laughs> well, we'll really, that. really miss your equanimity on this committee and your insight and your strategic, your insight and your ability to think strategically. So well, best of luck you. to you with everything going on. Thank you, your leadership and yours, Nate, much uh, appreciated. Learned a ton, Paul and Nat, my three years back buds and you newbies, good luck to you. Um, and yeah. thank you, it's been fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, I, I think we'll Thank always you. have we'll always have some of your DNA in this committee. I think I'll, I'll still be kind of hearing your voice in my in my ear as I'm looking at stuff like I'm what so would sorry. Andrew say about this? I'm so <laughs> sorry about the voice in the ear thing. <laughs> Very troubling. <laughs> but take care all. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, yes, I think I'll, um, stop recording from COVID ties. Yeah. So we finally got some vacation. Um, and, and let's hope it, it the partial release becomes fuller over time. Do we need to make a motion to dismiss this meeting or no? Yeah, I guess just to be formal, we could. Somebody else want to take a shot at it? Okay. <laughs> Everybody does. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks everyone. There's a few people in attendance. Uh, we'll, we'll end the meeting. Thanks committee. I'll send an email out, you know, probably tomorrow just with every summarizing everything um yeah and just you know if, if someone realizes those dates you know a date doesn't work like i said we can move it a day or two but not like a week so i think kind of the schedule we came up with is probably as close to final as we can get right now and um, i don't think the state's going to make any big changes um you know i don't think you know i think this is kind of an expedited round for them i think they had a lot of pushback when they said they were going to not have a 21 grant process and so they do this together pretty quickly. So I think, um, you know, I think, you know, a few communities I've spoken with, they're kind of worried just because it is so quick and they haven't changed their application as far as I know. So they're still expecting as much of an application process as it would have been if it was, you know, a full six months or longer. So I think it's gonna make people really busy. Uh, so thanks everyone for meeting. Again, thanks, Andrew. And um, yeah, I think good night. All right, good night. Good night. Thanks. Thanks.